Among the many challenges that the United Nations is faced with today, the most difficult is probably within its own walls, internal reform. It has been on the agenda of the UN over the past few decades, and yet, since the current Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, came into office in the beginning of 2017, UN reform has been his top priority. So two and a half years on, what has been achieved? What is the biggest obstacle and how to go forward? Welcome to this very special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin, here in the General Assembly Hall in the heart of the UN headquarters in New York. I'm very pleased to be joined by four distinguished panelists, and they are Mr. Jens Vandel, Under Secretary General of the United Nations, Special Advisor to Secretary General on UN Reform, Mr. Robert Piper, Assistant Secretary General for Development Coordination, Mr. Xu Hao Liang, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, Director of the Bureau of Policy and Program Support of the United Nations Development Program, and last but not least, Mr. Michael Kinsley Nina, Director for Central and Southern Africa Division, the United Nations Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. I'm um, feeling extremely lucky because we have almost all the very important people who are involved in this reform process. So, Mr. Vando, I'm going to start with you. Exactly where are we in terms of the progress of this very important reform that uh, Mr. Antonio Guterres has been prioritizing? Yeah. We are well advanced in the, the reform, but to answer the question, just give me a little bit of history that the Secretary General, when he took office, sat down and put out an agenda for probably the most ambitious reform of the UN since its uh, foundation. And, and he took that to the member states. And it was really uh, in June, July last year that the member states kind of gave back the, the, the proposals to the Secretary General and said, go and do it. Mm. So, so, so we've been at it for, for a bit more of a year in, in, in real terms. 1st January was kind of the first big milestone, and that's when we did some necessary restructuring. You mean 1st of, of January of this year? 1st January 2019. That means nine months ago. We, did, we, we executed the necessary restructuring of, of the United Nations itself, that means inside it, and then also between the various agencies. And w one of the key goals of that was to, in a sense, rationalize the structure, but also make clearer the resident coordination or the coordination at the country level. Mm -hmm. And that was done. Then inside there, uh, we also gave internally to the UN the biggest delegation downwards, because part of the purpose of the reform is not only generally making the UN more efficient, but it is also to empower the managers who are really in the countries, who are really in the field, who are even outside the capitals, far into in peacekeeping operations, mm -hmm. for example. The second big chunk we had to work with was to redo the, the, uh, the policy uh, instruments we use in particular for country level planning. And we just need to get better at it because the sustainable development goals, which are the 17 goals, they require a different approach for the UN. So it's an adaptation to this yeah. paradigm. And we, we got that set of, 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 of reform elements through in, 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 in May. And what is left for us in the years to come is to do the management side. That means get more efficient, save some money, get organized on the ground so we live in the same place, we're using some of the same management systems, and we get much more modern using computers and being digitized. Mm -hmm. Well, um, help the ordinary audience get a mm. better idea of the picture. If you are going to say this is a 100-meter dash, mm. the overall reform of the United Nations, mm. where are we <laughs> at this moment? <laughs> yeah. we, we are around the 50-meter. 50 50-meter, 50 yeah. okay. And then we are a very large organization, and we are very many different agencies. It makes us very complex, but it also makes us very effective in dealing with very difficult situations. Mm -hmm. We can deal with situations globally, and we can, we can operate in many different ways. However, the 50 meter is passed. We need to go another 50 meter, and in those 50 meter, not only sits, we need to get better management, but the reform itself. We, we need to change some culture, we need mm. to change some work. I think many people have been through these type of changes in either in their company or whatever. It's the same, that, that some of the changes take time to take hold. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah I see. Um, Mr. Piper, let me go to you then. You are very familiar with the SDGs, uh, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, everybody has been talking about that. There are 17 of them. So, in terms of the impact of the reform on the progress to achieve these goals, what kind of impact is it having? Is it having the kind of impact that you were desiring for? Well, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, to, to, these are the, the, the indicators that matter, ultimately. On my side, the development side of these reforms, it's all about faster progress towards 2030 and the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. That is the ultimate aim. The, the, the challenge for us, institutionally, is that we are still structured very traditionally around sectors like health and education and agriculture. And the sustainable development goals have given us much more horizontal issues like climate or urban spaces or jobs which require a much a much bigger mix of agencies to come together so my job with with the the, the team on the ground across uh, serving 165 countries and territories is to make sure that the UN is able to come together in the field on the ground where it matters on these types of issues on climate on jobs on water uh, on urban management and so forth. Mm -hmm. This is a huge, this requires very strong leadership on the ground. It requires uh, new instruments, new financing instruments, new planning instruments and so forth. So mm -hmm. I would say we are at the beginning of implementing a new business model, if you will, for the UN system uh, on the ground. We're not feeling it yet on the SDG acceleration. It's mm -hmm. too soon after nine months for me to tell you that we're seeing a jump, but we are seeing already very new uh, behaviours, new expectations of governments to the UN mm. in terms of the partnership. So we're, we're well on the way. Give us a concrete example. For instance, what have you seen as an indication that this reform is going to work or any specific feedback from member countries which um, give you the, the confidence that this is the right reform you're carrying out? So I, in, in, in many countries in the last six months, we've had a, a big shift in the approach of government towards the UN development system. Uh, uh, whether it is uh, Uzbekistan, for example, uh, or Senegal, um, um, we, have, we have now government, prime minister, calling the UN system in as a group. Uh, a, a conversation is now happening as a group between the UN and the cabinet in many countries that mm -hmm. have never happened before on the sustainable development goals, number one, and on the UN system's contribution towards those, those goals. So okay. the governments with, have laid out their expectation um, and, uh, and the UN has engaged on the different aspects of the SDGs depending on the country. The donors have also uh, has started to change their behaviours. So we have a number of countries in the last six months where donors for the first time are putting s substantial amounts of money, you know, in the case of Pakistan, for example, a, a big $50 million new program to work on the SDGs in frontier provinces mm. of, uh, of Pakistan to support the whole UN system. Not one, not one particular issue, but the system coming together. So we're seeing program governments, as we call them, the host government, okay. behaving differently, expecting more, and we're seeing that the member states who finance us also behaving differently and, and providing, mm -hmm. I think, much greater support for mm -hmm. what we need to do. That's really encouraging signs and very concrete evidence as, uh, as well that uh, things might be going in the right direction. Uh, Mr. Xu, let me come to you here. You're also Assistant uh, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, but you're more in the uh, policy and program support part. Um, specifically with the UN, de UN Development Program. Um, in which part of the reform are you <laughs> most involved and what have you been working on to, to be part of what uh, you know, these two gentlemen have been trying to push as well? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, the purpose of uh, these reforms are to make UN more effective, right? and uh, uh, especially at the country level. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what we have focused on is to uh, work with our member states together to uh, actively promote uh, an integrated approach to sustainable development. That has been uh, one of our central focuses. What it means is that, uh, you know, as uh, uh, my colleague said earlier, there are siloed approach in development. Now that exists not only in the UN system, it also uh, exists uh, 
among member states' governments. Sure, even within our workplaces. Right. Right. <laughs> That's so what you, we you complain have, all have, the time. Yeah, for example, you have a health ministry dealing with uh, health issues. Mm. Right? But when it comes to issues like HIV AIDS, for example, it is not simply a health issue. Right? It is an education issue. It is uh, a rights issue to start with, for example. So you need uh, the whole of government approach to deal with a phenomenon such as HIV infection, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you have many other issues, climate change, for example. It's not just a production issue, right? It is a pollution issue that's related to perhaps urbanization. When you build infrastructure, you create a lot of you know, climate change and greenhouse gas you know, emissions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of issues you know, require integrated approach. So what uh, UNDP, and along with our uh, UN development agency colleagues, are trying to do is to promote uh, an integrated approach. What does that mean? For example, you incorporate the SDGs, the 17 goals, the 2030 development agenda in national development planning process. You start with planning. Yeah. Right? And then you also work on, for example, localization of these SDGs at the different levels of the governments because the SDGs are ultimately achieved at the local level. Right? But you also need to work on financing. Right? Because Plans alone are not enough. Sure. And also, government today, government studies typically do not have enough financial resources to achieve all the SDGs. So you need to work with the whole of society, for example, the private sector, right? so that private sector invest their money according to sustainability principles, for example. Right? But we also need to work on data and, uh, and uh, statistics mm. so that you can track progress. You have good baseline, you can track progress. You also have a good feedback system to get people's involvement. Right? And uh, uh, last but not least, innovation. Right? So you have to constantly look at uh, how innovation can speed up you know, development process. Because uh, there's a lot of interruptions into this world yeah. that can help speed up you know, uh, innovation and development. So this is what we do, integrate approach. Yeah, how successful have you been doing that? I mean, just from hearing that, right. <laughs> it sounds like yeah. Mission Impossible. Yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of yeah. countries already have a lot of problems yeah. coordinating their own, uh, setting the goals yeah. for their development, yeah. and then you know implementing that, and then breaking the silos yeah. in their right. government systems or society. Yeah. And then you want to put the UN in there, right, yeah. and try, try to make these two work together. Right. It's uh, very important uh, to recognize that today uh, our you know, program country governments have much more capacity right, to design their uh, development policies and uh, implement their development initiatives more than 20, 30 years ago. So they have a uh, significant capacity themselves. But what we can do is to uh, work with them as equal partners to bring international experience and the practices mm. so that uh, there are lessons learned, you know, that can inform their decisions. Over the last few years, for example, yeah. we have helped more than 100 countries to implement this integrated planning system, for example. More than 100 developing countries in the, Over last, the last, last three to four years. Three to four right. years. So we have a you know, significant you know, uh, uh, sort of a network that we can call upon to support our governments with international expertise to, to add on to their own capacity. How, um, how cooperative or how welcome are you in member countries in, in terms of pushing through the, the reform process? Yeah. I think uh, you know, uh, it's very important uh, to recognize that, uh, again, the 2030 development agenda, the sustainable development goals, are the goals of our governments themselves. So all 193 countries approved this ag development agenda for mm -hmm. 2030 mm -hmm. at the General Assembly, as we are, uh, where we're, we're seated. Yeah. And uh, so it's their agenda. right? So we are not imposing anything that you know is from outside. So we are working with them to achieve their development. The level of trust is very important, but also you need um, certain resources. Yes. You need a lot of uh, um, willingness and, and wisdom as well, right, to, to, to work through such a kind of reform. In countries which are um, still very much um, 
in, in the way of development or mm -hmm. least developed countries, especially yeah. in Africa or yeah. in some parts of Asia or in other parts mm -hmm. of the world. I don't know how much obstacles there, how many obstacles there are in terms of push forward uh, these reforms. So, Mr. Kinsley Nina, yeah. may I turn to you sure. to uh, find out your insight into right. um, the, the challenges and the progress these informs have encountered in areas such as uh, Central and Southern Africa because you're very much uh, expert in that area but I also know that you are in the Department of Political and Peace Building Affairs okay. so um, how how much is reform covering those areas in, in those uh, regions of the world? Thank you very much. I think I will begin with a, a small observation. You gave us a, a striking metaphor uh, of a hundred meter dash mm -hmm. and you asked us how far we'd gone yeah. it would be an intriguing question uh, to ask whether we need to see the reforms more as a marathon okay. than a sprint <laughs> perhaps well uh, or whichever <laughs> event you may pick on the all right the let's say it's a, it's a marathon <laughs> where exactly. are we in this marathon exactly. then no i mentioned that because you raised the question of uh, obstacles uh, perhaps impediments in the way to achieving reforms. Uh, I will get to that in a minute, but uh, what I will say just generally about the pace of reforms, uh, one is that these reforms are mutually reinforcing. They are reforms that do not exist only in the peace and security dimension, not only in the management dimension or the development one. It requires us to see ourselves as a united united nations mm -hmm. that works in a harmonious way across departments and across the titles that we carry were you That's saying important. that the united nations was not united in the past not at all <laughs> i'd say we need <laughs> so to be more different? united okay we need to be more united yeah. in this. so the integral nature of the reform is one point and the second point i wanted to mention is that the united nations depends ultimately on member states to deliver the ultimate outcomes that we hope to achieve with the reforms. We are doing our part and it's important as my colleagues have pointed out that member states also do their part uh, and this is, this is an important aspect. You mentioned the Central and Southern Africa region. Uh, the peace and security and political reforms are extremely critical to addressing a very complex landscape of politics, insecurity, and development challenges. Mm -hmm. What we are learning from the reforms is that bringing together under one roof the conflict prevention, prevention uh, preventive diplomacy, mm -hmm. the mediation skills, the peace operations management skills, linking all of this together with the peace building apparatus of the United Nations and then moving forward into sustaining development as well. Connecting all of these important elements is the key to the future of peacekeeping and peace uh, building in Africa. Yeah. And we see so many opportunities. I'll give you two quick ones. Please. Uh, uh, in the Central African Republic, for example, where there has been a peace agreement agreed in February, uh, we see so many ch opportunities to link up the management of peace operations with mediation, preventive diplomacy and peace building. And we're working very closely with our colleagues in the peace building support office mm -hmm. to achieve this. Mm -hmm. Another example is the Democratic Republic of Congo, which as many of your uh, listeners may know, uh, went through an important election process at the end of last year. In that context, we had the opportunity to see peacekeeping working together with our colleagues in the political department who manage elections mm. and joining our strengths to ensure that we did our best for the people that we serve. Well, at this moment, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to um, challenge the, you know, what you have said because we don't have any assessment yet. You know, we are still, this is still very much a, a, a work in process. But mm. I'm going to ask you this common question. What do you see as the biggest obstacle on that 100 meter dash or <laughs> marathon <laughs> that you really are finding it difficult to overcome at this moment? Yeah. Just one. Who would like well, to yeah, jump into this? Yes. 
one very large obstacle the is... The biggest for you? It is our complexity. Okay. And it is nobody's fault, but the UN is a very complex organization. And getting, you can say, a unified um, um, way of working going forward has to go through a lot of different loops and different mechanisms and boards and, and meetings and stuff. And, and that, that is an obstacle mm. to, to us. And this requires, that's why the, the response to this is that the reform is big enough. Because if you, if you really go out and reform three things at the same time, big, in a big way, the reform is big enough to matter. Mm -hmm. And then there's more willingness to pay attention. We get a lot of support from member states. Mm -hmm. And this is not always the case in, in UN reform, but we, there's a strong consensus. And then also the other thing is this time we have the sustainable development goals as our common agenda, because it's not the UN's agenda, it is the global agenda. Yeah. Yeah. So at least for once the UN understands that it has to adapt to a global agenda. But well, we had the Millennium Goals yeah. as well, Millennium Development Goals as well. What, what is different this time yeah. than last the, time? The Millennium Development Goals were for the developing world. The Sustainable Development Goals are universal. Mm. This is for all of us. Mm. And it, as has as, uh, been mentioned by Mr. Piper, that, that, uh, that, that part of, for example, climate change is something we all have to work on. Right. Mm. So we understand the complexity is a barrier, and we have to be open about this. And, then, and so that's, I see that as the biggest. Mm. Any other answer other than complexity or, mm. yeah, I, Mr. Piper? I would you know, I would say time is our greatest enemy in these reforms. Uh, we really are in a hurry. The, the Sustainable Development Goals are all targeting 2030. That's yeah. only 11 years away. It's yeah. not very long. We have, as, as uh, uh, Jens said, a very strong member state alignment behind these reforms today, which really distinguish them from anything that has been attempted before. Mm -hmm. But we need to sustain that alignment because it is a, on the boards of the World Health Organization, the General Assembly in this room, in the Food and Agriculture Organization in Italy, we need the same message from 193 member states. Are this you common vision. We have got it. Uh, you have we have it extraordinarily well today and it's been sustained now for a couple of years. We need it to, to be sustained because this has come, this has been the problem in the past, of course, is that every different member states with different expectations, mm. not only between them, but within each member state with different parts of a government with different expectations. Mm. We have today a unique uh, consensus amongst but, our but member states. But that's not a challenge then. That's it's the not a challenge, but it will be to sustain it over time. So okay. I'm saying that time is our enemy. We've, yeah. got, to, we've got to maintain that sure. consensus and we've well, got to move very fast. Uh, yeah. let, I'm not going to um, pretend that we don't know the different voices that come out of this room, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> right behind us on that podium. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have leaders come and say, you know, um, we want our interests first. Um, I don't want to name names, but it is true. And we are seeing some not so encouraging signs. I don't know, is that affecting the progress of the reforms that you're talking about? And is that taking away from the time that you're finding so precious? Well, I think the case for multilateralism is stronger and stronger. Uh, you think I think so? the, 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 the problems of today uh, are not going to be solved by countries alone. So the case for cooperation, collaboration at the international level mm. um, is stronger and stronger. And okay. I think that, that message is still strong. Member yeah. states come and go in their strength of their conviction on how to support it, but uh, uh, of course that changes every country, the positions shift. Mm. Um, but the underlying momentum is very, very much. Okay you know, pushing in this direction of, of, of solving practical global problems using these instruments, this multilateral world uh, yeah. as, a, as a partner. Okay. Uh, let me go to Michael yes. because you wanted to say something. No, right? I just wanted to strongly endorse that. You asked what are, what's the greatest challenge. One way of looking at it is that we face a challenge of high expectations mm. from the people of the world who the United Nations ultimately serves. When we reform, we make promises that we, by redefining the way we work, by working better together, we can achieve results. And that is what we are well on the way to achieving. However, ultimately, we rely on member states to deliver. And the point that uh, Mr. Piper made, that uh, we need to understand, we need to reach a point where the world understands that individual member states will always have their interests, but it is critical that the 
interests of the world at large should also be recognized mm -hmm. and act as a spur to collective action in order to address the issues that are faced globally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, let, yeah. do you want to... No, I just want to say, react that, that while the for sure different interests, my view is when I talk to member states today, they want a better UN. Mm -hmm. When I talk to people, they want a better UN. Yeah. And in a sense, that is why time is a problem, that if we could be better tomorrow, like instant coffee, just a couple of spoonfuls and some water, mm -hmm. we would do it. But so there's strong support for a big and ambitious reform. Mm. And this is one of the reasons we will succeed this time. Mm. Okay, and Mr. If Shea. I can add to your question uh, of obstacles, I think uh, uh, one of, uh, which has to be uh, that we should recognize our, our own limitations. Okay. Mm. And uh, uh, the fact is that uh, you know, there's a lot of innovation that are taking place in the world outside the UN. Our member states uh, look to us for solutions, right? but uh, we're not able to provide all the solutions ourselves. Mm. Right? If we pretend that in today's world that the UN has all the solutions, uh, it will not be serious. Right? But what we can see is that we can work with you with a trusted relationship to find the solutions together. Mm -hmm. That's definitely what we can offer. Mm -hmm. We have uh, solutions to many challenges and questions, mm -hmm. but uh, the best way to find solutions is uh, co-creation mm -hmm. of these solutions. So Co-creation of right. the solutions, that's yeah. a very interesting term. Yeah. Well, we're running out of time, so yeah. I'm really just going to ask you, each of you, to um, say one sentence, really, looking forward, going ahead, to, mm -hmm. to finish that half journey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is the most important thing you want to push forward for? Okay, let me start then. I want people to see a more responsive UN. And I want them to see also the more uh, open UN. That means that, we, and also that we are more honest about what we do well mm -hmm. and what we don't do so well. And 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 then, as has been mentioned by Haryan, working together, and so we are open and people can access us and work together with us. This is what we want to push through, and 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 go for it. In mm -hmm. a sense. Mm -hmm. Honesty, yeah. being open, yes. and working with people. Yeah. Mr. Piper. I would say two things. One is focus. The Sustainable Development Goals is an agenda for the entire UN. It's not simply a development issue. We need to come together. So one, to stay focused on delivering this for the planet. Mm -hmm. We can do that. The planet will be a better place and the UN will be a, a, a more robust, a kind of popular uh, and supported institution. Mm -hmm. So I think that a, a sense of absolute uh, focus and then with that, higher expectations from our member states. We want them to expect more from yeah. the UN. <laughs> Hal Yang is absolutely right. We don't yeah. want to overstate. The opposite. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but I think we do. We want yeah. member states yeah. to, to expect the most from us. Yeah. Uh, and, to give and you the pressure necessary. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Don't, don't give up. Absolutely. All right. So shall we sh should they <laughs> lower their expectations? No, 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 no. <laughs> the expectations are all right. I think, I think what I would say is that uh, in all our efforts, uh, and it's, um, it's very important to recognize member states and governments as our major interlocutors mm -hmm. here in this room. Mm -hmm. But I think the, my message would be that we never forget that we always bear in mind those who are more vulnerable, those who are marginalized, mm -hmm. refugees, migrants, in some countries, women, youth. We should look at them not as victims, but we should recognize the potential that they offer to help us find solutions to peace and security issues yeah. as well as to development issues. Okay. And that is where our focus should be. That's where our focus should remain alongside all our other work. Mm -hmm. The vulnerable. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Shu. Yeah. For me, I think, uh, I, I guess for all of us, is really we want the highest level of political commitment to help us to achieve. From member countries. From, from member states. Member mm -hmm. And from our own uh, leadership and mm -hmm. ourselves. Mm -hmm to help achieve results mm. at the lowest level for everybody. Okay. Yes, I think that's what we need to do. Mm. All yeah. right. Well, from the discussion today, I think we have a lot to be happy about, but even mm. more to work hard on. Thank okay. you so much Thank for you very much. all Thank of you. our distinguished guests. And with that, we are coming to the end of this very special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. This is only the first part of our, uh, of our efforts here. We're going to talk about China and the United Nations 40 years on in our next episode. So do stay tuned. Many thanks for watching this edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. You can 
can always go to YouTube and Facebook and look, look for The Point with LX to find our programs. Thank you very much.